It's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not the preacher, not the deacon, but it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not the preacher, not the deacon, but it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not my father, not my mother, but it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not my father, not my mother, but it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord. Standing in the need of prayer. Well, good morning, everyone, everywhere, and welcome to worship with Homer United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Lisa. Here in Homer, we live on the ancestral land of the Sukpiak and Dena'ina peoples within the boundaries of the Nanilchik Village tribe. And I am grateful for their care of this glorious piece of creation that we call home. If you are worshiping online today, I invite you to take a second to like the video, say good morning in the comments, and be sure you send us a message if you have any special prayer requests. And for all of you who are worshiping here in person today as well, I thank you so much for continuing to follow our safety protocols. As always, I expect everyone to make the choice that is best for your health and your family. Our worship team will continue to live stream from here in the sanctuary and you join in worship in whatever way is best for you and your family. Today we are continuing our series called Liberation, the Scriptural Path of Freedom. Last week I shared that in 1807, a group of clergy and plantation owners published a deeply edited version of the Bible for use with enslaved people. This so-called slave Bible was carefully crafted to eliminate any hope of liberation. Last week, I gave you an overview of the context in which this version of the Bible was published and invited you to explore that Bible. And uh, if you didn't get one last week, there are some more copies of this chart out on the lectern. These are also linked on our website um, and in the Prepare for Worship newsletter. If you are online, you can download the PDF version of that. Um, this week, we're going to dig a little bit deeper into the scriptures that were retained and the message and story that they told in this edited version of Christianity. I am grateful to my friend and colleague, Reverend Dr. Leroy Barber, for the inspiration for this series. As we uh, enter into our time of opening prayer together today, let us consider that we are living in a time of suffering right now. And throughout our lives, we have all suffered in different ways. But we know that we cannot allow our own pain and sorrow to cloud the magnitude of the atrocity of slavery and the continuing tragedy of systemic racism and oppression. Cole Arthur Riley, the author of Black Liturgies, encourages us to not let ourselves become numb. So let's consider these words as we stand together for our opening prayer. 
hear these centering words today. Protect the part of you that still winces at pain. Refuse to become familiar with tragedy. Our souls were made to stir. Let us bow together. God, who is moved to tears, in a world of so much trauma and tragedy, it is difficult to not become numb. We confess we are desensitized to the cries of our neighbors. We confess that global terror can roll off us like water. Help us from our familiarization with pain, that instead it would always rouse our spirit. Keep us from that obsessive attunement which is prone towards savior complexes and feigned allyship and lead us into a kind of solidarity that reminds us that in pausing to bear witness to suffering, we do not become a rescuer. We do not become the voice and free us from the responsibility to feel every pain at once. Help us to discern our capacity for solidarity for lament, and when we stand and when we rest and allow others to do so, we remember that our activism is shared among the collective. We are never alone. Amen. I invite you to remain in a spirit of prayer as you are seated, and we will enter into our practice of breath prayer together. Remember, during a breath prayer, we have one phrase that we say to ourselves on our inhalation and one phrase that we say to ourselves on our exhalation. So I um, will invite you into a posture of prayer as we breathe and pray together. Inhale. I will not become numb to oppression. Exhale. God stir my stagnant soul. Inhale. I will not become numb to oppression. Exhale. God stir my stagnant soul. Inhale. I will not become numb to oppression. Exhale. God stir my stagnant soul. Inhale. Exhale. I will not become numb to oppression. God, stir my stagnant soul. Amen.
please bow with me. Open the doors of our hearts. Open the doors of our hearts to the word we would hear and the word we, we would not. Open the doors of our hearts to them who is it is easy to love and to those who it is not. Open the doors of our hearts to the stranger when it's, it's convenient and when it is not. Open the doors of our hearts wider than the fears that limit us. Open the doors of our hearts to hear your word today. Amen. Last week, we heard how the midwives, Shipra and Pua, defied Pharaoh and saved the baby boys of the Israelites. Today, we hear the story of one of those boys. This is Exodus chapter 1, verse 22, to chapter 2, verse 10, New, stand, New Revised Standard Version. And then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every boy that is born to the Hebrews, you shall throw into the river into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman, and the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him for three months. And when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus, papyrus basket for him and plastered it with vitamin and pitch, and she put the child in it and placed it among the reeds in the river. And the sister, his sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe in the river. While her attendants walked beside the river, she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. And when she opened it, she saw the child and he was crying, so she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrews' children, she said. And then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get you a nurse from the Hebrew woman to nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child and nurse it for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. And when the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and she took him as her son, and she named him Moses. Because, she said, I drew him out of the water. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. It's so nice to see you here. So we heard a story today about something that a parent did to protect her child. And so I was thinking about protection and the way we protect each other. And I noticed that for the big kids, we're wearing masks. One of the things that we do to protect each other right now is to wear masks. We also use a lot of this. What's this, Emma? hand sanitizer. We are using a lot of hand sanitizer these days. We're wearing our masks, and if we're big enough kids, we can also get vaccinated to help protect each other. So we're doing really good at, you did, good job. So we're doing really good at protecting each other. So we can understand a mom wanting to protect her little baby. And so we heard this mom protected her baby by putting him in a basket and floating him in the river. Do you think my basket would float right now? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> it's got too many holes in it. What could we do to make this basket better? We could put tar over it. That would be good. Yep, we could put tar over it and wait until it hardens. We have got a budding engineer here. I love it. Yeah, and that way it would float. And that's what... It could. We wouldn't want concrete. That would be. We want it to float, not to sink. And so that is what we heard that Moses' mom did, that she put pitch. Have you ever touched a spruce tree and gotten your hand sticky? Sap is also called pitch. You've done that before? And so that's what she did. Oh, because it's waterproof. So that would help the basket float. 
Yeah. <laughs> and so she made the basket waterproof so that she could put the baby Moses in it and put it in the river. And if you heard the story, you heard that another woman found Moses in the basket floating in the river and took him out. And he was able to have his mom come and help care for him again. So we're just learning about Moses. So we see him as a little baby who was so loved by his mom that she did everything she could to protect him, even by putting him in a basket and floating him over to another woman to help take care of him. And so next week, we are going to hear more about Moses's life. So keep in mind that this week we're talking about the baby whose mother loved him and protected him. And next week, we're going to see him and learn some more stories about when he's grown up. So let's pray together. God, we thank you for all the ways that we can protect each other. Help us know that we show our love for each other by keeping each other safe. We thank you for the stories from the Bible that show us your love and protection for us, just like Moses' mom's love and protection for him. Let us love each other like that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for coming up today. It's good seeing you. You may have heard on the news that a school board in Tennessee voted to ban the book Mouse by Art Spiegelman. This announcement was released in January of this year, ironically, on the day before Holocaust Remembrance Day. Mouse is a graphic novel that tells the story of Spiegelman's parents in a concentration camp during the Holocaust the mass murder of Jews by the Nazis that they witnessed, and the long-term effects that that time of terror had on his parents, including his mom's later suicide. Mouse is unique among Holocaust literature in that it does not focus on the Christian saviors of the Jewish people. It doesn't focus on good Gentiles who hid Jews or helped them escape to freedom. Mouse does not contain a redemptive arc or a happy ending. It is a really hard, harsh look at a time of horror and violence, and the book captures that time of terror in words and pictures. Mouse joins a long list of books that have been banned in this country because of violence, language, nudity, death, and so many of those books have one major thing in common, the abuse of ethnic or racial minority groups by dominant and predominantly white groups. Commonly banned books include The Color Purple by Alice Walker, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings by Maya Angelou, and both The Bluest Eye and Beloved by Toni Morrison. You'll notice that those are all three black women authors. The most commonly cited reason for the challenges to those books are that they are sexually explicit, but those challenges don't mention that the explicit content is the sometimes autobiographic abuse of black women at the hands of white men. Banning books attempts to erase history by hiding history, often with the excuse of protecting the children. But the reality, it was children who went through some of these horrific experiences. And if children suffered it, then modern children should be able to learn about it and learn from it. The excuse of banning books for nudity, language, content, or disturbing images also strikes me as ironic considering that some of the most disturbing stories I have ever read, the ones that haunt me and break my heart over and over again, are stories from the Bible. Stories of murder, rape, incest, war, genocide, gratuitous violence, and of course, over and over again, slavery. If we were truly banning books based on content, the Bible should be at the top of the list. Last week, I invited you to look over this comparison chart between the full text of the Bible and the so-called slave Bible, edited for use with enslaved people, and compare the stories that they tell. Today, we're going to take a look at what they left in, which books and chapters were retained, and the stories that they tell. So let's start 
at the beginning with Genesis. Genesis begins exactly as you would expect it to, with God creating the heavens and the earth. The origin story is left intact, with omnipotent God creating all things, including humans. And as we know, those humans were disobedient to God, and they're punished with ejection from the garden. Then we jump forward a bit to Noah. Again, we have an omnipotent God and sinful humans. And those humans were so sinful that God decides on the ultimate punishment to completely wipe them out except for one obedient man and his family. And then there's another jump in the narrative from chapter 8 all the way to chapter 18 where we're introduced to Abraham and Sarah who will become parents of nations. Then there's another huge leap all the way to chapter 37 which starts... Joseph is hated by his brothers. Then bits and pieces of the narrative that's included tell the story of Joseph being sold into slavery by his brothers. Joseph's story is actually told extensively in this slave version of the Bible, from his dreams and his interpretation of his dreams to being brought into the palace of Pharaoh to interpret Pharaoh's dreams to his elevation in the ranks and eventually his incredible wealth and status, making him even as a slave in a position of power and authority to save his family when there's famine in the land. And that's where Genesis ends. So looking at the narrative arc of this revised book of Genesis, we can see that the focus is on action and consequence. Adam and Eve, disobedient, punished. Humanity, disobedient, punished. Noah, obedient, rewarded. Abraham, obedient, rewarded. Joseph, obedient, even prosperous. Maybe slavery isn't so bad after all, right? The purposeful inclusion of the story of Joseph prospering under slavery intentionally paints slavery in a positive light, making empty promises to enslaved and oppressed people that if they are just obedient and work hard enough, they can prosper even under the yoke of slavery. If we jump forward to the New Testament and look at the verses retained there, we can see that the same narrative is continued through the New Testament uh, edits of the book. Looking in particular at the book of Romans, only two chapters were retained from the book, and reading them in the context of the slave Bible wildly changes their meaning. So listen through the ears of enslaved and oppressed people as you hear these verses. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Do not think more highly of yourself than you ought. Outdo one another in showing honor. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Never avenge yourself, but leave room for the wrath of God, for vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except for God, and those authorities that exist have been instituted by God. Do what is good, and you will receive approval. These verses, which within the context of the whole sweep of the narrative of Romans, teaches us how to live and work together as the body of Christ in this world, become words of oppression. When used to claim that white authorities were instituted in the order of God and obedience is the same as faithfulness. I read to you last week the scripture from 1 Peter, the only epistle that was retained in its entirety, which commands slaves to obey their masters, not just the gentle ones, but the harsh ones as well. And that theme continues throughout the other retained verses. Ephesians 5, be subject to one another. Ephesians 6, slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling and singleness of heart as you obey Christ, not only while being watched, 
in order to please them, but as a slave of Christ doing the will of God, render service with enthusiasm as to the Lord, knowing that whatever good we do, we will receive the same again from the Lord, whether we are slaves or free. 1 Thessalonians 5, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God for you. 1 Timothy 1, the law is good. 1 Timothy 2, prayers, supplications, and thanksgivings be made for everyone, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and dignity. 2 Timothy 2, share in suffering like a good soldier of Christ. Titus 2 has an extensive chapter included that tells slaves to be submissive to their masters. Hebrews 2 says that every transgression or disobedience receives a just penalty. Hebrews 12, endure your trials for discipline. 1 John 3, sin is lawlessness. Again and again, like the fall of a hammer, freedom and free will are chipped out of the Bible, shaping the good news into a narrative of authority and obedience, reward and punishment, master and slave. This gospel of obedience is underscored by a slightly different but related narrative. Reverend Dr. Leroy Barber calls this the promise of the sweet by and by. Removed are all the stories of healing, freedom, and release from captivity in the here and now. And instead, the editors just retain promises of rewards in heaven. For example, 1 Corinthians 15, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Be steadfast and immovable in the word of the Lord, because you know that in the Lord your labors are not in vain. 2 Corinthians 4 and 5, we know the one who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us and bring us into your presence. Even though our outer nature wastes away, our inner nature is being renewed. We know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made by hands, eternal in heaven. James, be patient, therefore, until the coming of the Lord. The overwhelming message is that things might be rough for you right now, but wait, just wait until heaven. It'll be great then. Things will be better. And the more you suffer here on earth, the sweeter those things will be later. As Barber says, this promise of the sweet by and by eradicates the need for justice on earth. The narrative arc of this slave Bible claims that God purposefully created the world and everything in it in a very certain and specific order. God gave authority to some people, white people, and God made slaves of others, black people. The purpose of life is to obey and show respect to your master. If you're disobedient, you'll be punished. If you work hard, you might prosper. The more harshly you're treated on earth, the more rewards you'll receive in heaven. This careful editing removes any promise of liberation in the present of the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. And instead, Barber says this becomes a partial Christianity, a gospel not about abundant life, but about power and control. I think one really significant point that we need to remember is that this was an edit, not a rewrite. Those clergy and slave owners who were intentionally working to oppress and subdue people who had been kidnapped and enslaved did not rewrite a single verse of scripture. Our Bible says all of these things. So the question for us is what do we do with that? How do we approach scripture in a way that is both faithful and contextual. What is our work when it comes to interpreting scripture? There is definitely a fundamentalist stream through modern Christianity that leans hard on verses from Deuteronomy and Revelation that says nothing should be added or taken away from these words, which is interpreted to mean the Bible as a whole. This, this belief is that the Bible is the literal, inerrant, infallible word of God, and every single verse must be given exact equal weight to every other verse. But even in those most 
fundamental circles. This is not actually lived out. No one is arguing in favor of returning to slavery because the Bible tells me so. The reality is that we have to read the Bible with our whole selves, our whole experience, our whole knowledge of human history. In the Methodist tradition, we say that scripture is the foundation of our faith, but we interpret scripture together in community, and we apply scripture with reason, tradition, and experience. Scripture, tradition, reason, and experience are sometimes called the Wesleyan quadrilateral, which is a big mouthful for saying that these are the boundaries through which we interpret scripture. These are the guardrails that keep us interpreting faithfully. They are the lens through which we view scripture, bringing our reason, our minds to it, bringing our experience, not just of our individual selves, but of our communal world and the experiences of all people in our world and tradition as well, as we rely on ancient interpretations and see how or if they still apply today. We don't treat every single scripture in the Bible as if it has equal weight and equal application in our lives. We know that the world changes, our understanding changes, and the Bible isn't static either. It's the inspired and inspiring word of God. And of course we know that the absolute word of God was made flesh in Jesus Christ, whose life and ministry provides our ultimate guide to faith and to relationships with all the people around us. In the coming weeks, we're going to look at the scriptures that were cut out of the slave Bible and the story that those scriptures tell, which is a very different narrative than the story of obedience and punishment that we heard today. So in preparation for this, here is your invitation for this week. I invite you to reflect on the sweep of the biblical narrative. If you were going to write a one paragraph summary of what the Bible's about. Or if somebody who had no experience at all with Christianity asked you, what is the Bible about? How would you answer that? What do you see as the message of scripture? We heard today the, the twisted message of scripture through the slave Bible. And so let's consider how that compares to the message of scripture as you interpret it. May we, through the course of this study, honor the lives of oppressed people, those who found freedom and those who are still seeking it. And may we find ways that we can be instruments of God's liberating grace as we walk the scriptural path of freedom. Amen. stand as you're able for our time of prayer. 
our prayer this week is based on a prayer from Howard Thurman's book, Meditations of the Heart, called Our Little Lives. This is a responsive prayer. When I say our little lives, our big problems, please respond, these we place upon your altar. Let us turn to God in prayer. The quietness of your temple of silence rebuffs us again and again. We struggle with the discipline to hold steady in the waiting, and our minds reject the noiseless presence of your spirit. Our thoughts are scattered, and we struggle to focus on you. Our little lives, our big problems, these we place upon your altar. War and the threat of war covers us with heavy shadows. Oppression and systemic racism endures. Days are filled with foreboding and nights with anxiety. We do not know how to continue to live faithfully in this time of loneliness, death, and pain. Our little lives, our big problems, these we place upon your altar. Brood over our spirits, God. Blow through us and refresh us. Breathe into us and inspire us. Light the fire in our hearts again that we may find strength for today and courage and hope for tomorrow. Our little lives, our big problems, these we place upon your altar. In confidence, we rest in your amazing grace, which makes possible triumph over defeat, gain out of loss, and love from hate. We rejoice this day to say, our little lives, our big problems, these we place upon your altar. With the confidence of children of God, let us pray the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, as always, for your continued generosity. Your gifts and tithes make possible our missions and ministries here in this community, around the state, the nation, and even the world through our connectional system. If you're in person and would like to make a donation today, we do have a donation box in the back. Uh, if you are worshiping online, you can visit our website. You can see the address down below for our donation button or send a check to the street address that you see on the screen. Thank you all for your continued generosity. Our offering prayer is based on the writings of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Will you please bow with me? We refuse to believe that we are unable to influence the events around us. We refuse to believe that we are bound by racism, war, and injustice. Instead, we believe that those around us are our brothers and sisters. We believe in dignity every day and that our brokenness can be healed. We believe that we can overcome oppression and violence without resorting to it. We remember that hate cannot drive out hate, only love can. May our tithes and offerings be a tangible sign of our love of others. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen.
Will you please rise for our closing blessing? Go forth today to proclaim God's love and liberation. Go forth to live lives of justice and freedom. Go forth to respect the honor and dignity of all people. Go forth to be the body of Christ. Amen. Thank you.